Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is John Mack. I'm Managing Director of Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I was thinking earlier that myself and the programs team in January are usually really worried about snowstorms and bad travel for our speakers getting here, but today we're lucky the weather is reasonable. We were mostly worried about which coat to wear, and Dr. Nussbaum lives closely enough where the flights weren't an issue. So today's good. Uh, before we begin, please know that we are on the record and we are live streaming. Your phone should be on so that you can tweet and ask questions, but you should silence them, please. As well, please know that views of the individuals that we host are their own. They are not representative of the council. After the presentation, we will take questions from the microphones in the room as well as online through your browser at the website ccga.live. We broadcast it on the sides and on the YouTube channel. Today's topic is one that we're excited to kick off our season with. The ideas presented tonight will be something to keep with you as we explore America 2020 over the next 12 months. To lead this discussion, I am pleased to welcome Martha Nussbaum. Dr. Nussbaum is the Ernst Fund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago, where she is jointly appointed in the Law School and the Philosophy Department. Her research interests include ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, political philosophy, feminism, feminism and ethics, including animal rights. In 2016, she was awarded the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy, and in 2018, the Berggruen Prize. She is the author of several books, and her latest, The Cosmopolitan Tradition, A Noble But Flawed Ideal, is the topic for this evening, and it's available for signing from our friends at the bookseller um, after the program. For now, please join me in welcoming back to the Council, Dr. Martha Nussbaum. much, John, and thank you all for being here. It's great to be back here, but not back because you're in a glorious new location. So um, cosmopolitanism has uh, come in for controversy, even in the, uh, in, in the Congress. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley attacked me by name, uh, on the, but not imputing to me the views of this book, because he didn't know about this book, but earlier views, and saying that cosmopolitans are dangerous because they disregard the moral worth of the nation. And so, you know, this is, uh, what kind of citizens are we? Are we fundamentally citizens of the whole world or also of the nation? And, and so that is a big debate that we should be reflecting about. And the point of the book is not so much to engage in current affairs, but to step back and look at the history of the idea that we're all citizens of a single world and, and ask what's great about it and what m might be in need of retooling. So asked where he came from, Diogenes the Cynic in the fourth century BC, answered with a single word, cosmopolites, which means a citizen of the world. This moment, however fictional, might be said to inaugurate a long tradition of cosmopolitan political thought in the Western tradition. So here's a Greek male uh, who refuses the invitation to define himself by lineage, city, social class, even free birth, even gender. He insists on defining himself in terms of a characteristic that he shares with all other human beings, male and female, Greek and non-Greek, slave and free. And by calling himself not simply a dweller in the world, but a citizen of the world, Diogenes suggests also the possibility of a politics, or at least a moral approach to politics, that focuses on the humanity that we all share, rather than the marks of local origin, status, class, and gender that divide us. It's a first step on a long road that leads through Kant's resonant idea of the kingdom of ends, a virtual polity of moral aspiration that unites all rational beings, and to Kant's version of a cosmopolitan politics that should join all humanity under laws given not by convention and class, but by free moral choice. Diogenes, they said, quote, used to make fun of good birth and distinctions of rank and all that sort of thing, calling them decorations of vice. The only correct political order, he said, was that in the world, the cosmos as a whole. Now, cynic and later stoic cosmopolitanism urges us to recognize the equal and unconditional worth of all human beings, rather than focusing on traits that depend on fortuitous national or social arrangements. 
The insight that politics ought to treat us as both equal and as having a worth beyond price is, I think, one of the best insights of Western political thought. It's responsible for much that is fine in the current human rights movement and the Western political imagination more generally. One day, they say, Alexander the Great came and stood over Diogenes as he was sunning himself in the marketplace. He, he lived in a tub in the marketplace. Ask me for anything you want, Alexander says. Diogenes says, get out of my light. <laughs> this image of the dignity of humanity, which can shine out in its nakedness unless it's shadowed by the false claims of rank and kingship, a dignity that only needs the removal of that shadow to be vigorous and free, is one endpoint of a, a line that does lead straight into the modern human rights movement. Now, in the tradition that I'm describing in the book, dignity is non-hierarchical. It belongs, and in equal measure, to all who have some basic threshold level of capacity for agency, very broadly understood. The tradition explicitly and pointedly excludes non-human animals, and I'm going to come back to that because that's one of my main beefs with it. Uh, it also excludes, in some versions, humans with severe cognitive disabilities, and that, too, is a big issue. These shortcomings must be addressed in any contemporary version of the idea. The idea of dignity is not, however, as in some modern accounts of the origins of dignity, it is not inherently hierarchical or based on the idea of a rank-ordered society. In the medieval and early modern era, versions of the idea of dignity did crop up that were hierarchical and suited to a feudal society. I don't study those ideas here or the traditions they ground. So it's important to recognize that the stoic cosmopolitanism has an egalitarian heart, and that is the part that I pursue. And it's also enormously influential in the modern era in ways that have sometimes been neglected. Now, taken by itself, this vision need not involve politics. It's a moral ideal. In the thought of many of the tradition's exemplars, however, the idea of equal human dignity does give rise to a distinctive set of obligations for national and international politics. The idea of respect for humanity has indeed been at the root of much of the best constitutional thinking in many constitutional traditions, and as I said, of the human rights movement. Nor is the idea of equal human dignity peculiar to the philosophical traditions of the West, although those traditions are my theme in the present book, but I, I think it's important to mention other origins. In an India riven by hierarchical ideas of caste and occupations assigned at birth, Buddhism has long brought a different idea, the idea of human equality. Although Gandhi reinterpreted the Hindu tradition in a more egalitarian manner than was conventional, the Buddhist antecedents of the new nation's founding principle of equal citizenship, I'm afraid very much under assault in the present moment, were dramatized by Gandhi, Nehru, and the other national founders by placing the Buddhist wheel of law at the center of the Indian flag, where it still sits today, for how long? The main architect of India's constitution, B.R. Ambedkar, one of the great legal minds of the 20th century, converted to Buddhism late in his life and remained entranced by it throughout his life. A so-called untouchable, now called Dalit, he insisted on framing the Indian constitution in ways that put the idea of equal human dignity front and center. He actually wrote an entire book on the Buddha, published in 1957, shortly after his death, in order to make clear his love of that tradition's idea of human equality. Similarly, the freedom movement in South Africa made respect for human dignity the center of its revolutionary politics. In this case, Stoic doctrines actually did play a forming role alongside traditional African ideas of Ubuntu. Philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah has emphasized the formative role of Cicero's Stoic idea of world citizenship in the life and work of his father, Joe Appia, one of the leading founders of the modern nation of Ghana. He discussed, um, Joe Appia discussed the ubiquity of Cicero's ideas in at least all the Anglophone parts of Africa. 
But recently it has also emerged that Nelson Mandela, who later entitled a book of interviews and letters, Conversations with Myself, alluding explicitly to the influence of Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius, had access to Marcus's meditations already as a prisoner on Robben Island. When South Africa's constitution was much later written, it contained those ideas. Whatever the role of Stoic ideas in the founding document, at least they dovetailed with ideas that Mandela had already derived from his own traditions and his experience. When the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was framed, its framers included representatives of many world traditions, including those of Egypt, China, and Europe. As French philosopher Jacques Maritain relates, they explicitly avoided language that was the sectarian property of any one particular tradition. For example, they avoided the Christian word soul. The language of equal human dignity, however, as an ethical notion attached to no particular religion was something they felt they could use and they did make central. The ideas of the cosmopolitan tradition have then been immensely fertile and they've intersected with similar ideas from other traditions. But the founders of this Western tradition also introduce a problem with which the tradition has been wrestling ever since, and this is one of my big themes in the book. For they think that in order to treat people as having a dignity that's truly equal and that life's accidents can't erode, they must scoff at money, rank and power, saying that they are completely unnecessary for a flourishing human life. The dignity of moral choice is complete in itself. Diogenes doesn't need to ask Alexander for a decent minimum living standard, for citizenship, for health care. All he needs to say is get, it, get out of my light. Moral personality is complete and completely beautiful without any external aid. Cosmopolitan politics appears to its framers to impose stringent duties of respect, including, interestingly, an end to aggressive war, support for people who have been unjustly attacked, and a ban on what they already called crimes against humanity, including genocide, rape, and torture. But it imposes no duties of material aid on the grounds that human beings do not really need the goods of fortune. Without such aid, dignity is still inviolate. This bifurcation of duties is problematic for several reasons. First, material inequality is a huge fact of human life, too glaring in its effects to be overlooked. A child born this year in the US has a life expectancy of 79.1 years. A child born in Swaziland can expect to live only 49 years. Clean water, health services, sanitation, maternal health and safety, adequate nutrition, access to education, all these basic human goods are distributed very unevenly around the world. Although all nations contain internal inequalities, it's also glaringly apparent that the accident of being born in one country rather than another pervasively shapes the life chances of every child who is born. This gap outstrips internal gaps. So the first and largest problem with the tradition then is that it neglects this fact of staggering importance. The ancient Greeks and Romans did not have our data and very likely their world did contain fewer inequalities between nations, maybe even smaller internal inequalities than our world does. Still, the differences were large enough and philosophers such as Cicero, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius well-traveled and busily engaged in projects of imperial expansion should not have passed them over. A second problem with the bifurcation of duties is that it involves the pretense that fulfilling what they called the duties of justice, the duties to protect people from aggressive war and so forth, does not require material expenditure, something that obviously is pretty clearly false if we include among those duties, duties to protect other people from aggressive war, from torture, from slavery, and from other crimes against humanity. Indeed, the cost of defending our allies in a defensive war will probably vastly exceed the costs that would be involved in ending all world hunger. Once we see this, we should think that this distinction 
is one of degree, not of kind, and maybe not even one of degree, so far as spending our own resources is concerned. But there's a deeper incoherence, I think. The tradition appears to hold that material possessions make no difference to the exercise of our capacities for choice and other aspects of our human dignity. If one really believes that human dignity is totally Im immune to the accidents of fortune, then slavery, torture, and unjust war don't damage it any more than hunger and disease do. But this seems false. People who are ill-nourished, who have no clean water, and no access to resources connected to health, education, and other material goods are not equally able to cultivate their capacities for choice or to express their basic human dignity. To put this in terms of the modern human rights movement, what we now call the first generation rights, such as religious freedom and political liberty, really do require the second generation rights, the economic and social rights. The mind and soul are aspects of a living body that needs nutrition, healthcare, and other material goods. Incoherent or not, though, the bifurcation of duties between duties of justice and duties of material aid has exercised a decisive influence on the course of international politics and on the developing human rights movement. We have a fairly well worked out set of doctrines about the duties of justice in, embodied in international law and international treaties, which command wide assent and that have become the basis for widely agreed accounts of the first generation rights. We have no equally clear doctrines on the other duties, those in the second generation, and we don't even quite know where to begin once we step outside national boundaries. So the chapters in the book investigate the attractive ideas that the tradition begins with, but then the gradual realization of the internal problems. I select examples that follow a particular logical trajectory, starting from Cicero, who was not a Stoic in all areas, but extremely close to the Stoics in ethics and politics. And I include the Orthodox Stoics, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, and then I probe and revise those doctrines. So my basic story describes the origins of the bifurcation of duties and traces a series of gradual steps away from it in the direction of a more capacious idea of transnational and also national obligation, culminating, uh, culminating ultimately in what I have long called the capabilities approach, an approach that with economist Amartya Sen I've been developing for many years, and uh, I have my own particular version of it. So I begin in chapter two with Cicero's On Duties, one of the most valuable and influential works of political thought in the Western tradition and also actually in Africa. Appius says his father had two books on his bedside table, Cicero's On Duties and the Bible, and one that has influenced most subsequent attempts to think about the moral underpinnings of international relations. Cicero develops the picture of a world where justice in some manner governs all human relations. And in an attractive way, he describes those duties of justice and what they require of nations and individuals. In his treatment of the proper occasions for war, the jus ad bellum, and the proper conduct in war, jus in bello, he lays the foundations for all subsequent Western law of war. But at the same time, Cicero begins the puzzling bifurcation of duties, treating the duties of material aid very differently from the way in which he treats the duties of justice. So my chapter critically scrutinizes that bifurcation. But I also note that as soon as Cicero announces the bifurcation, he already begins to move away from it with his fascinating insistence on a doctrine of negative responsibility. Namely, we're culpable not just for wrongs that we actively do, but for many wrongs that we fail to actively prevent. The cosmopolitan tradition turns out to have another deep problem, which lies in the realm of human psychology. So my next chapter presents and confronts that issue, beginning a little bit earlier, actually, than Cicero's time with the Greek cynics and the Greek Stoics, 
but focusing on the second century Stoic emperor Marcus Aurelius and his convoluted negotiations with the notion of equal dignity. His work poses some questions relevant to the bifurcation of duties, asking us to ponder what type of treatment human dignity requires if it really is, as the Stoics hold, inalienable and indestructible. What damage is actually done by slavery, for example, if the dignity of the slave is never affected by it? So I ponder these difficult questions about dignity, showing that Stoicism needs, but does not yet have, a distinction that I call a distinction between levels of capability, which I ultimately try to supply, namely between the innate potentiality of human beings and then its um, further nurtured expression. Meanwhile, Marcus's cosmopolitanism also reveals aspects of the motivational and emotional underpinnings of cosmopolitanism that make our worries deepen. Can a cosmopolitan politics provide real people with a basis for emotions toward one another sufficient to motivate altruistic conduct without losing a sense of personal meaning. Surely some statements by Marcus, who asks us to renounce close personal ties to family, city, and group, and to see all the armies that clash around him as merely crazed mice running for shelter, seem to threaten the sources of deep emotional concern and the very source of our motivation to act. Sometimes they seem even to leave us, leave us with a barren life in which nothing is worth loving or doing. To get a sense of how we might begin solving that problem, I return to Cicero at the end of this chapter. A committed Roman patriot who said actually that he loved two things most in the world, his daughter and the Roman Republic, and that he had lost both of them in the same year, 44 BC, Cicero lost his life to assassination in 43, shortly after writing on duties, while carrying out a last ditch effort to save the Roman Republic. In the work itself, he makes it clear that although all human beings are bound to all other human beings by ties of recognition and concern, and therefore by duties and obligations, the motivational tie to one's own Republic has a special salience for the organization of one's entire moral and political life, because we're bound in thick ties of participation in institutions that divine, de define our choices. At the same time, he tries to show that the right type of cosmopolitanism can make room for that special tie if it's coordinated in the right way, and can also make a large place for friendship and close family love. In, contemporary, in two contemporaneous works on friendship and on aging, and above all in his correspondence with his best friend Atticus, Cicero shows the enormous importance of these bonds of love in a life that's dedicated to justice. More persuasively by far, I think, than the Stoics, Cicero balances the near and the far pointing the way to a reasonable moral psychology for today's world. He argues that these bonds are not just motivationally and instrumentally, but also intrinsically valuable. So I will come back, I come back to that at the conclusion of the book. But now with the next chapter, I leap ahead to the modern era, turning to the Dutch philosopher and lawyer, Hugo Grotius, 1583 to 1645, whose magisterial work on the law of war and peace, 1625, sets the agenda for modern international law, basically modern law of war, and also makes many general contributions to the articulation of an international order suffused with moral norms. Grotius is deeply and obviously indebted to Cicero and the Stoics. He sees his enterprise as continuing theirs and famously and shockingly, even while professing himself a devout Christian, he says politics does not need a theistic Christian foundation. He also argues against a position that Hobbes would shortly develop on international politics that will hold that no moral relations at all obtain between states. He supports the Ciceronian Stoic idea that 
international relations should be grounded on moral norms of respect for humanity. So I study those arguments and the picture of nations and of international morality that emerges, since by now we are in a world with nations. Grotius, like Cicero, gives moral importance to the nation, but he also argues that nations and their citizens have binding moral obligations to people in other nations. Throughout, we have to remember that recognizing the moral centrality of the nation in the way that Grotius did and that I will later recommend does not entail and indeed positively forbids a type of me first tub thunk thumping nationalism that's all too familiar in our time. Grotius's nuanced and conflicted doctrine of humanitarian intervention gives useful guidance to us as we grapple with the claims of humanity and the sometimes opposing claims of national sovereignty. Further, he takes a decisive step away from the Ciceronian bifurcation of duties by admitting transnational duties of material aid in some circumstances alongside duties of justice. Grotius's writings provide an attractive and highly influential basis for much in international law. But this material aid aspect of his thinking has often been neglected. This side of his thought also includes a valuable account of duties to admit and assist needy migrants. Furthermore, he articulates a promising basis for thinking that all nations share some duties to protect the natural environment. Finally, as does Cicero, Grotius also makes a start toward resolving Marcus's motivational problem by imagining the world community as a society in which each of us participates while at the same time, each of us should cherish our own nations as special sources and vehicles of human autonomy, accountability, and connection. Next chapter turns to Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790. Smith is often misrepresented as a simplistic champion of the unfettered free market, although a new wave of Smith scholarship has begun to undo those misreadings. In fact, I think it's Smith, among all my interlocutors, who makes the most useful contribution toward undoing the bifurcation of duties, emphasizing in the wealth of nations itself the importance of national commitment to material redistribution. Smith, who often lectured on Cicero and the Stoics, is steeped in their writings, quoting effortlessly and without even putting in footnotes, since he presupposes similar familiarity on the part of his readers. But in The Wealth of Nations, he goes much further even than Grotius in undoing Cicero's mistakes by arguing that the claims of humanity generate stringent duties of material aid in the domestic context, particularly in the areas of health and education. These duties are to some extent extended to the entire world, although Smith focuses there on his critique of the slave trade and of colonial domination and the economic damage that colonial domination does to colonized nations. So those four essays leave us with achievements, but also with big problems to solve. My two concluding chapters move from the history to the contemporary normative view that I've developed and called the capabilities approach. So in chapter six of the book, I investigate several issues that the tradition simply doesn't talk enough about, but which must figure in any decent international politics today. So the first, I go back to the moral psychology issue, and I say, what is the motivational importance to the near and dear? And how can we build this in to a cosmopolitan politics? Uh, without denying that we owe something to all our fellow world citizens, and certainly to our national citizens, which a just tax structure would presumably arrange, it is possible to cultivate a type of patriotism that is on the one hand compatible with strong, familial, friendly, and personal love, and that on the other hand builds ties of recognition and concern outward to people outside our national borders. So it's again the Ciceronian task of trying to to start from the middle terrain of the 
Republican institutions, but then move both outward and inward. And this has actually often been done in the modern era. Great political leaders, including Lincoln, Nehru, FDR, and Martin Luther King Jr. have succeeded, at least uh, for periods of time, in cultivating that type of mixed concern in their nations. Next, I confront a problem posed by people's plural religions and other what John Rawls calls comprehensive doctrines, that is their views, whether religious or secular, of what the best human life is. Cosmopolitans tended to believe that just one normative ethical view is the best one, and that people could be governed in accordance with that view. Contemporaries of Grotius, and even more in the world of Smith, however, already knew that that wasn't gonna be the case. Religious freedom and religious non-establishment are, they thought, key elements of any decent national order. But cosmopolitanism, if it's gonna make anything of that idea, has to change. So I discuss and defend the generalized form of this idea of non-establishment of any one comprehensive doctrine that John Rawls has called political liberalism, namely the idea that core political principles should not be built on any single comprehensive doctrine, whether religious or secular, but should avoid sectarianism as far as possible while still espousing some core moral doctrines that may be able to command what Rawls calls an overlapping consensus among all the holders of the reasonable comprehensive doctrines. I then try to show what this idea might look like in the larger world between nations and what sort of conception of international society it supports. On this issue, cosmopolitanism needs major, major amendment, but much of its content can still be preserved as the international human rights movement, already a form of political liberalism as Marita conceived it, shows us. Our next two problems are, I think, thornier. They're both set in motion by the recognition that in the modern world, the nation is a unit of both practical and normative importance. It's normatively central, Grotius argues, because it's the largest unit we know that's an effective vehicle of human autonomy, that is, our right to give ourselves laws. And it's also the largest unit that's fully accountable to people's voices. And it's of great practical importance because its institutions have great power in today's world as places where both duties of justice and duties of material aid are made real. If the nation were not normatively central, we might try to supplant it in its practical role, but I think its normative importance ought to curb such ambitions. My next problem then is well, what to do about material aid given this normative role for nations. This issue too is both normative and practical. We can produce a very good moral argument to the effect that morality requires richer nations and their citizens to provide a good deal more than they currently do to poorer nations, and this is something that I've actually said in earlier work. That's what the bifurcation denied, and undoing the bifurcation is what my argument has been all about. Such aid could be normatively problematic if it was given out in a paternalistic way, as so often it is. So the first question is how aid can be given consistently with the aided people's right to make their own choices and their own laws. But now we're beginning to learn that there's another problem of a practical sort that greets us even if we were to solve that normative problem. There's mounting evidence, most compellingly argued by Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton, but supported by many scholars of economics and international politics, that foreign aid is basically useless or even at times counterproductive in that the dependency on money from abroad erodes local political will to come up with a sustainable, decent, let's say, health infrastructure <clears throat> and education infrastructure and so on. So if we're morally required to do something with our excess stuff, but we can't see what we could possibly do that would actually make things better, what then? Well, I try to give a cautious but not utterly despairing answer to that question. Finally, 
we must confront more than Grotius did the problem of migration, both refugees seeking asylum from persecution and war and economic migrants seeking a better way of life. Given my insistence on the importance of material conditions for the exercise of our human powers, these two reasons for migrating are not always distinct, nor should they be. This problem was ignored by most members of the cosmopolitan tradition, although in practical terms, the Romans did make a start, extending Roman citizenship to most parts of the empire and putting them under Roman law and giving them the right to bring lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. And although Smith mordantly observed that the problem of unequal wealth between nations is in large part created by illicit colonial plunder. Whatever the origins of the desperation with which people now are fleeing their homelands, we need to have a lot to say about it if we are to assess the contemporary viability of the cosmopolitan project. This is a huge philosophical issue. In fact, our law philosophy workshop all year this year at the Law School at U of Chicago is uh, devoting itself to that issue, and we're bringing in all the leading philosophers who've written about it. And of course, it deserves a full book of its own or more than several books. And it has, indeed, received some excellent philosophical analyses. Now, here you'll see that I've so far been silent about one of the very largest problems with the cosmopolitan tradition. It's moral rationalism, it's disdain for non-human animals and the world of nature. Typically, the tradition grounds our duties in the worth and dignity of moral and rational agency. Now, this isn't even a very good approach for the humankind, since it's, at least unless we change it a lot, it excludes humans with severe cognitive disabilities, who certainly are our fellow world citizens and ought to be viewed as equal in worth and dignity. And it certainly excludes non-human animals. The tradition often argues for human equal worth, precisely through a pejorative contrast with the brute beasts, as they put it. Look how far above the beasts we all are. So we need an international politics that is truly cosmopolitan, that is thinking about the whole world. And such a politics, I argue, must be grounded more generally in the worth and dignity of all sentient bodies. That's a project for, of course, again, for another book, and I am writing that book right now. But my concluding chapter, From Cosmopolitanism to the Capabilities Approach, then describes where we are with a version of my capabilities approach that extends to all nations and to all people, but that gives a special place to the nation. And then I, I ask how we ought to think about the relative claims of the nation and the world, about the prospects of our moral emotions and motivations in a newly complex world. As for the bifurcation, how should we think of economic and social rights as national duties? And is there any useful way of extending those duties to the whole world, given the economic problems I've mentioned? I end by defending the general approach of the tradition, if not its detailed general, uh, if, if not its detailed uh, conclusion, namely that moral duties do not stop at the national boundary, and we're all bound to all others by some ties of recognition and concern. But I end that chapter and the book with, I think, this, this huge challenge that has got to face us now, extending the cosmopolitan project to non-human animals and the world of nature. The Stoics among the ancient Greek philosophical schools were the least interested in the moral claims of non-human animals. There are other places we could turn at this point, but certainly the Stoics, as I say, they actually built their human egalitarianism on the basis of a denial of all worth and dignity to animals. Treating them as brute beasts, they refused all evidence, which other philosophers had really mentioned ubiquitously, of their complex perceptual and even ethical capacities. They showed indifference even to their sentience. So if we're going to salvage anything of the cosmopolitan tradition, we must put that problem front and center. We must and can do better. 
Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Nussbaum. Lots to think about there for sure. So uh, we have microphones in the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will point to you and wait for a microphone. We have one right here, sir. I'll be monitoring what's coming in online too, so we'll weave that in as we can. Yes, could you please, it's, it's working. working. Could you please tell us what would you think is, what is the opposite of cosmopolitanism? Is it tribalism, nationalism? And what are the big major philosophical differences between the two? Well, okay, I mean, as I've defined it, cosmopolitanism is a view that we owe very stringent duties to all world citizens, and it, 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 it's something further, namely the idea that we are first and foremost citizens of the whole world and only secondarily citizens of some local region. So, I mean, there are a number of ways we could think of the opposite. I guess the most opposite is egoism that we don't just owe any duties to anyone else other than ourselves. Uh, the other might be a kind of clannishness and tribalism. That would be a little bit more altruistic than egoism, but it would still stop short. And then a kind of um, blinkered nationalism of the sort that says, oh yes, well, it stops at the national border. That would be still strongly opposed to it. Uh, and then, in fact, that, that's really what they were gunning for because they knew uh, that people other than them had made lots of objections to tribalism and egoism. But it doesn't mean, as I say, so we could have a form of cosmopolitanism that still has a strong place for the nation. And so I don't want to say nationalism in all its forms is the opposite of cosmopolitanism, but a sort that says, oh, our duties stop at the nation. That sort would be. Okay, next question. All right, I'll go online until we have some more in the room. Uh, we have quite a few questions on the environment, which you've mentioned a few times. Somebody back there, I see. Oh, we'll go here first then, please. Okay. Thank you. What is the commercial application of these ideas for global business leaders? Well, you know, there's a kind of cheap view that's sometimes called cosmopolitanism, namely we should all be a kind of free world travelers, sophisticates, and so on. And, you know, I think that's what Hawley was really attacking, the idea that, oh, here are these elites who are comfortable going anywhere and traveling any place, and they don't understand that most people don't have that wherewithal, and they don't uh, understand that for most people who are not rich, the nation is of very central importance. So, uh, you know, I want to not use the word in that way. I'm using it in the original philosophical way. I guess I think there are lots of applications in the issue of intellectual property, for example. I think, you know, Madhavi Sunder in um, From Goods to the Good Life, an excellent book, argues that these ideas, I mean, she's a friend of mine and we've talked about this for years, uh, show that we shouldn't protect so stringently copyright and other intellectual property restrictions, we should be much more, much more recognition of world culture and the right of world citizens to borrow freely here and there to create their own culture. I, I think that's one very good application. In the educational sphere, I think duties of technology transfer, idea transfer, are a big part of what we can do. I mean, I, I said I try not to be despairing about the uselessness of foreign aid, and I, I do think that in the healthcare area, Deaton has really shown that it, by doing his comparative study of the Indian states, that throwing a lot of money at a state will often, if not usually, be counterproductive, because what people need to do is to muster the political will, as Tamil Nadu and Kerala have done, to develop a useful and sustainable healthcare structure. But I think that the educational sphere is not quite like that, because there are ways that we can, without uh, eroding political will, we can promote education and technology transfer. There are hundreds of ways, of course, to do that, and I think a university like my own does have stringent duties to people around the world. One way we, we do that is actually setting up centers for scholarly exchange in a variety of places, one of them being in Delhi, where I'm particularly involved. And I like that way because it just recognizes the scholars and intellectuals in that country as agents, not just as passive recipients of super, superior knowledge. 
Our Beijing Center has a, what's called a Nobel Prize wall that shows all these white male faces, a view of Chicago people who've won the Nobel Prize. And you know, I don't like that because it just says, oh, we're going to give you our largesse and you're not intellectual agents. So I think intellect fostering intellectual cooperation, transfer, but in a way that shows respect. And there's lots more to be said about that. Okay, next question, right here in the center. How do you keep political creeds from creeping into the various ideas of cosmopolitanism? Well, look, I mean, you first of all, you have to define your terms carefully because the word, as I say, it's dandied around in politics in ways that are far from precise. And I think, you know, Hawley was just mushy in what he was attacking. He had a point, I think, which is that elites should not be ignorant of their own nation and they shouldn't model their view of politics on what their wealth gives them a chance to do that other people don't have a chance to do. But you know, in other respects, he didn't even know what that tradition had been claiming. So I think if we once define clearly what the tradition says and which parts of it we're talking about, then of course it does latch in um, to different parts of modern politics. That is, people who are doing environmental ethics these days often refer to Grotius's idea of the world as the common possession of all humanity. So too do people talking about migration. So we have to ask, uh, are they doing that correctly? And of course, it doesn't matter. They might be right anyway. But in fact, Grotius's own view supports only a very stingy kind of admission of uh, asylum seekers, not the idea that the earth is the common possession just turns out to mean that if people are truly desperate and they're washed up on your shores, you shouldn't turn them away. And that's something, you know, it's a lot in this present world, but it's probably not all we need. So, so you know, at each point, we just have to be critical and vigilant and say what, what we think is right. And I think also we, we must not slip into the easy idea that cosmopolitanism means we must be working for a world state. I've moved on this, I guess, at one point in my early career. I used to think world state's a good idea, but after many years working in the United Nations, I've been disabused of that idea, of seeing the cronyism and the inefficiency and the total. Uh, well, the fact, of course, is that there's a, a, a sinecure position and you can nominate somebody for that, you're not always going to nominate people that will do the best for the whole world. And most of the people that I was working with in the UN were, you know, time servers and cronies and so on. So anyway, that particular version of a world state is pretty bad. But could there be a world state? Well, I actually think we should be careful about that. Kant retreated from the idea of a world state to the idea of a federation of republics all over the world that would be bound to one another in some ways, rather like the modern world. And he did that because he was worried about the domination of one state, even if it was a world state, because even if it was a good one at first, it can go to the bad, and then there's nothing to check it unless aliens should invade, right? So I think, you know, we just think for ourselves, basically. And I, I, I think most people's politics is, to some extent, thoughtful and inspired by ideas of what they think best. So we, we should keep raising those questions with our, with our students and get them to think for themselves, but not just shout slogans, but to debate and disagree in ways that, let's hope, will clarify to all of them the roots of their own politics. I, I gave um, part of my Berguin Prize last year to establish a set of lunchtime roundtables on controversial political issues of the day where there would be a team of faculty who disagree, and then about 15 students would sign up, and presumably they disagree, and they certainly do in our law school, and then they discuss with civility and with argument, and they try to make progress on this issue. So I think, you know, that's my picture of process as a teacher in class, but also in these extra things, because the problem here is we're so polarized politically that if I give a class, 
I'm afraid only the left-wing students will take that class, very few exceptions. And so we have, at our law school especially, hugely talented conservative Christian students and conservative other students, but they do not take classes in philosophy because they think that's a left-wing bastion. So one of the things that I love about these roundtables, I'm doing one in a week with the conservative law professor Will Bode, is um, it's actually on should we legalize cocaine and heroin, so it's not on cosmopolitanism, but you know. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, you know, when we disagree, it's important to get all the people into the room and listen to them all. I don't actually know what, uh, what these various philosophers would say to that. I don't think they were so keen on inclusive dialogue. Um, even the person, I'm, I'm the Ernst Freund professor. Ernst Freund, one of the greatest figures in Chicago politics, leading labor lawyer and all these things. But when Ernst Freund taught comparative politics, I think, as far as I've been able to find out, he just wanted students who would agree with him and learn from him. Uh, and you know, I think it's crucial that we don't just do that. So um, if people are to ever talk to one another, they have to start in undergraduate school and in graduate school. And let's just hope that as faculty members we can promote that rather than falling back, as I, I fear it happens even in philosophy departments, on an easy knee-jerk attitude toward what the right view is or the acceptable view. So anyway, that's a long answer, but that's, I think we have to think about process. Uh, okay, we'll go right here and then I'll follow up on that. Just microphone coming, one second please. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on what you just said. Uh, you said that people wouldn't, students wouldn't take your class if they, because they thought they would disagree with you and didn't want to have this left-wing view. Is there, and if it's ever gonna happen, it's gonna happen at the University of Chicago, is there some way to disconnect particular politics from the concept of talking to people who are of different views and coming up with a better solution often, in my experience, than either one of you would have come up with. Is there some way to teach, because college is a good place to do that. Yeah, yeah. Is there some way to teach that that won't a priori turn off either conservatives or liberals? Well, you know, I mean, if they did take my class, they would find out that I do welcome disagreement. But the problem, I think it's twofold. First of all, they think, oh, that's that left-wing pablum or whatever. But they also worry about having my name on their transcript when they apply for clerkships with the Supreme Court and so on. So there is that problem too, because if the society they're going out into is highly polarized. And so how do I deal with it? Well, these lunches, but also team teaching. Will Bode, who's, he's actually a libertarian. He's not, I don't know whether to call him conservative, not exactly, but anyway, he's respected by conservatives. He's an originalist, and he's a lovely, lovely human being uh, who just has a gentle and kind of maternal manner towards students. He wins their trust and confidence. So I taught a whole course with Will on uh, called public morality and legal conservatism, where we looked at first philosophical debates about liberty and morality, but then we went into certain issues, prostitution, pornography, same-sex marriage, and a whole host of actual issues. And there I did, for the first time, have a whole bunch of Christian conservative students because they trusted Will, but then he also saw some people that he probably doesn't usually see because they trusted me, and he blogs enough that left-wing students may well think, although they'd be totally wrong, that, that, that they couldn't disagree with him. So anyway, they met each other, and we had the most wonderful discussions, particularly on the issue of same-sex marriage, where I really do think these Christian right-wing students are being young, quite, they were quite naive, and they did think that if you just say, well, look, marriage is this valuable institution, sorry, society's based on it, so just buck up and join that institution. And so when I read from the biography of Herbert Hart, the leading philosopher of law in the 20th century who was a closeted gay man and who did get married, and he records in his journals 
how listening to the chamber music of Schubert was the first glimpse he had of a truly fulfilled human life. You know, then they suddenly sort of wake up. Oh, well, maybe it's not so easy as just making yourself do the moral thing, because actually his wife was quite miserable, his children were quite miserable, and so you can't just will happiness, and they begin to understand that point, and then the gay, one gay student from Alabama said, you know, I am a conservative, and I'm from Alabama, and I'm a closeted gay man, and I can understand what heart means by the psychic cost of repression. And you see, I remember that two years ago, because it was such a moment of connection. No, I don't know how long it'll last. You know, they go out and they clerk for Edith Jones and other conservative judges. How long will they be able to say that? But at least for the moment, it's a, a weight on the side of real debate. I have these debates all the time with my family because that does contain large differences. And I, you know, I think sometimes I get a few points across. I can't give up on reason. I can't just say, oh, those people, they're saying this and this. I can't, I can't stop answering. That's my advice, I guess. But anyway, I, you know, I think um, I would love to have much more disagreement. You would think in a course on feminism that I would have disagreement even within the feminist community. And I, I do sometimes, and I love it, and I tolerate it, and I deliberately structure the course around different brands of feminism, pro and con, and I invite people to debate it. But uh, nonetheless, I, I think uh, people are afraid of argument. So we have to really work on that. Great, I think we can do one more. We'll do right here, sir, this side. Hi there. Um, I'm not suggesting that Senator Hawley was being sincere or well-informed in his criticism of the concept of um, cosmopolitanism, but is there some basis to the idea that there's a disconnect between the people who espouse philosophically a cosmopolitan ideal and the material reality of an economic system that is leading to greater and greater wealth disparities and, and sort of disparities in um, the human condition. I mean, you see this tension every year increasingly at Davos when you've got <laughs> people from the capitalist elite on one end and, and global activists on the other. So. Is there some basis for this criticism of cosmopolitanism? Well, I think there's a lot of ignorance, and also, even in a way worse, a lot of ignorant paternalism, thinking, oh, well, if those poor people in India are going to make progress on some issue, we have to do it for them. I remember after the first big gang rape thing in Delhi, there was a task force report from the Harvard Law School that said, we are setting up a group that will advise India and other, other patriarchal societies of the problems that their women face. Now, really, India having a proud feminist tradition, the first uh, female representative to the United Nations was an Indian woman and so on. Anyway, a proud, long feminist tradition. They were way ahead of Harvard Law School, I must say. And the, the terrible condescension that that showed. So if we, uh, you know, if we get rid of that, that would be progress. But I also think philosophers really need to know much more about the world. And they really, really, really don't in a lot of cases. I do a lot of work with economists. So Sen and I set up this whole Human Development and Capability Association to bring young philosophers and young economists, some older ones too, you know, Amartya is now 87, so um, together to talk about these problems and to work out solutions because we think that we found ignorance on both sides. The philosophers never informed themselves about the economic realities, even though we said in the first project we had, we paid them $5,000 for their papers. They didn't do even do the background reading. The economists are so, you know, they think economics is sort of the major discipline of the world, and they don't bother to think thoroughly and respectfully about the philosophical argument. So we try, we fight this fight in our association. I don't know that it's made that much dent on the profession of economics. A little more on the profession of philosophy. I think there's more world-driven philosophy now than there used to be. But the economics profession is so mathematical in its university form 
that anyone who really talks about development, for example, is likely to be looked down upon. We don't even really have development economics in our economics department. So um, I do teach regularly a course on global inequality with an economist who is in the law school. In law schools and in business schools, you find economists who are different, who really are world-driven, who know the facts. And my colleague David Weisbach happens to be a tax expert, but he's just passionate about global welfare and global inequality, and we teach this class. And of course, um, we learn from each other because uh, I could not know half of what he knows. But another thing that I insist on in the class is we have to know history and reality. And so often, economists and philosophers make these universal claims, and they aren't grounded in knowledge of any one nation, not even their own. So uh, since I've spent many years working in India, studying India, writing about India, I insist on two weeks out of nine, two full weeks, be spent on the study of the history of the Indian nation, its legal institutions, rural urban differences. Not, I mean, not that it's more important than other nations, it just happens to be the one that I know something about. But just to show you the kind of work you have to do, because otherwise these people who set up this experiment here and this experiment there, they're just not grounded enough. And so that is the other thing that I, I think is truly lacking. I find that even academic colleagues of mine who are very eminent thinkers, they're likely to assume that Indira Gandhi was the daughter of Mohandas Gandhi, rather than, of course, as she was, Nehru's daughter. And in fact, she got the name Gandhi in a completely unrelated way because she married a Parsi, not even Hindu, whose name was Feroz Gandhi. But these simple facts, you know, people just don't even know that. And so I do feel basic education before you open your mouth on any of these issues is a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a great note to end on. Uh, I said at the top end that these are ideas that we're going to need to think about throughout the year, and that's for sure the case. So if you agree, the book is for sale, and Martha will sign it. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Nussbaum. Oh, thank you very much.